Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good morning from my behalf. And thanks for having me. It's uh, so cool to be here at in one of the fastest growing Belgian companies in this space. And I really like the example with the, with the AR because many people think AR is either for gaming or for the porn industry. And this is one of the most brilliant examples I've ever seen on how you can use it in, in B2B. And I personally think AR will be huge in B2B sales to create that experience. So I was really impressed with that. And thanks for, for having me here. I'm very happy I can share the, the story of customers the day after tomorrow. Because I think if you look at where we are at this time in the digital world, it is a very, very interesting turning point. Uh, I, I have the feeling that we're entering a new phase. Uh, we, we moved from the digital world to the mobile world. Uh, in the last 20 years, uh, and it all started when this man made his small announcement. This was the impact of that. Uh, so the, the, the big winners of phase two were companies like Apple, companies like Facebook. You still meet people that think that Facebook is not relevant for B2B companies. You still meet people that think that Facebook is going down because their neighbor's cousin's aunt is not using it anymore. These are the facts. Uh, 2017. 48% of the time that you're watching your iPhone screen is on a Facebook property. 4% is on all other apps together. So that's not bad huh? if that is your company performance. But what we've learned in this phase two of digital is that those big platforms have become world dominant. Huh? We we've have discovered world dominant players in the East and the West, huh? Google, Amazon, Facebook versus um, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and the power of these guys is huge. I, I mean, you probably followed the whole soap opera between Snapchat and Facebook. Uh, Snapchat is popular among youngsters. And at a certain day, Mark Zuckerberg decided that he wanted to buy Snapchat uh, because he wanted that target group to be part of his audience. So he took his private jet, flew to Venice Beach in LA, where the headquarters of Snapchat are, and he offered them $3 billion. Those guys were then the founders 22, I think. So I don't know what you did when you were 22, uh, but they got a visit from Mark Zuckerberg and he said, a billion and a half for you, a billion and a half for you, what do you think? And the guy said, Mark, please go back to Menlo Park and leave us alone and don't come back anymore with those stupid offers that you have for us. We have more important things to do. So Mark Zuckerberg, went back to, California, to uh, Silicon Valley. He went back a second time, gave him a few billion dollars more. Again, they said, Mark, didn't you hear us the first time? Huh? We are not interested in this. So he went back to Menlo Park, completely pissed off, and he decided to change strategy, and no longer to buy them, but to destroy them. Huh? That's a different approach. And he used a very simple strategy. He copy-pasted every tool that makes Snapchat popular and implemented that on his one billion people using platforms like Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. And this is now what you see the impact is. I mean, about a year ago, they launched Instagram Stories, which is a clear copy-paste of Snapchat. In about six months' time, they crushed them. Growth of Instagram stories exploded since then. Snapchat is flattening down. We're entering, or we entered, that winner-takes-all market. I mean, if you ask me, Amazon is probably the most impressive company at this moment to see what they're doing. Last week, we had Toys R Us that went out of business. And you can question, why did these guys go out of business? Is it because Amazon is so powerful or because they made the wrong choices? It's probably a combination of the two. In my opinion, what they did didn't do, the guys from Toys R Us and many other companies in the world that come from an analog world, they don't follow the customer. I mean, if you hear Louis' story, where you see that buying experience is more imp important than product and price, ask yourself how much of your resources is going to product and price versus how much of your resources is going to buying experience. I mean, you all saw the slide, but I'm pretty sure if you would make the analysis, there's much more effort going to all the small, neaty details of your product and less resources to the buying experience. Your job is to follow the customer. I've seen so many companies like Toys R Us, like the travel industry, that don't follow the customer, they follow the distribution channel. I mean, all the travel companies, they said, hey, but we can't do online because we have all these tra travel agents. They're going to be pissed off at us. All the retailers said, we can't do e-commerce because our stores will think we're competing with them. Yeah. But if you follow your distribution channel, 
it is a guaranteed road to failure. Following the customer is the only thing you can do. But we live in this world of very dominant players. And I think in phase three of digital, their role will become more dominant than it is today. And phase one was about information, phase two was about mobile, phase three is clearly about AI, like you just saw in the presentation of Louis and PJ as well. But the, the interesting part, if you look at the, the, the world thinking about AI, artificial intelligence today, if you have to describe the emotions about it, we're in between fear and excitement. I'm extremely excited about it, but some people are extremely scared. Huh? I love the idea of what robots can do, and some people are afraid of what robots can do. Huh? <laughs> so you, you, you feel that we're in between that fear and excitement. We are excited about all kind of new applications. Huh? We will not need a babysitter anymore in the near future. Uh, we will be able to go to a restaurant and drink like crazy in the near future. Thank God for driverless vehicles. We will probably not even die because of that overconsumption of alcohol, because they will solve that for us. So there's lots to be excited about. At the same time, sometimes when people see or hear stuff about new technologies, they freak out. Huh? They freak out. They think, oh my God, this is worse than a real roller coaster. Um, people are very good in creating doom scenarios, eh? thinking like, oh my God, those driverless cars, will it really work or will it become more dangerous than, I mean, these incompetent humans that are driving today? Uh, by the way, I found a video that shows you what the world of driverless cars will really look like. We, we think it's going to be boring like this, eh? it's very safe, but that's not human enough, so we will not use it. So if you look at human behavior, it should be more like this, those driverless cars. Eh? This is more like what we are used to. The only difference is it's safe, that you will not get killed, that's the only difference. But, but you can also imagine the, the big ethical questions that we will have. Huh? Just think about driverless cars. When we take people up to Google and we talk with them about driverless cars, the typical European question is this one. Yes, but um, what if there's a tree that falls on the road and your car is coming there at full speed? How will you program the car? Huh? Will you kill the driver? Or will you drive around the car and kill the two children on the sidewalk? Mr. Google, how do you program the car? Uh, that's a typical European question. But you can imagine the ethical debate about this. So I was, I was really surprised and actually happy to see that Mercedes said, we are taking a stand in this. It is our job to protect the driver. Huh? So whatever happens, we will protect the driver. And I was just thinking, just imagine the future of marketing and sales. Uh, we will have totally new positioning strategies for companies in the future. Like, I found some advertising of 2025 of Mercedes and BMW. So this is what it will look like. We save the driver, huh? even if it means we have to drive over an old lady. Huh? This will be a new positioning strategy for those brands. Or this one, we'll save the children, we hope you'll forgive us. Huh? That's a totally different positioning in the market. So these are the kind of new ways of marketing and sales that we will discover in the future. But if you look at the world of artificial intelligence, we're in between fear and excitement. And to be honest, it makes a lot of sense that we are scared about this. Huh? The, the media is fantastic in creating doom scenarios about fake news, about job loss, about Terminator scenarios, and they are absolutely right. Yeah, I, I found a beautiful picture here of this important man. Um, but if you look at fake news and the whole discussion of today, we're just getting started. I mean, today we have text fake news, articles on Facebook. It's Mickey Mouse stuff. Huh? Pretty soon you will have this, like Liarbird is a Canadian company, and the only thing you need is 30 seconds of recordings of someone's voice, you give it to them, and you can let that person say anything you want. It's not perfect yet, but it's pretty good. Uh, two weeks ago, I was at UC Berkeley talking with Peter Abel, huh? a Belgian top professor in the field of AI. This is what he made. An image that looks almost exactly like the real one. If you wouldn't see the left part of this video, you would be 100% sure that I would be showing you a zebra. He is convinced that with the next elections in the US, fake news will be like this, combined with the sound thing. You will hear and see video and sound of famous people, entrepreneurs, politicians, and we will not know if it's true or not. 
Think about the changes of data. Uh, today we're worried about the cookies of Facebook. Ooh. Today Europe is fining Google. Ooh. It's only the beginning. I mean, think about the idea of face data compared to the data that you're using today. What you're doing today is, is basic stuff compared to this. I mean, look at the presentation of the iPhone 10. They were blamed that it's not innovative. I'm not going to talk about that, but look at that face recognition thing. That phone is expensive, right? But it does have that piece of technology in it, which means that that piece of, of technology is extremely cheap to recognize someone's face and to so see the difference between a picture, a mask, and a real face. You saw these articles. Huh? where the, the Guardian reported that based on that analysis, they can know your sexual preferences. Now, most of us live in Europe, in the US. We are very thankful for that. But imagine that you live in Saudi Arabia and you're gay. Uh, this is not the headline of the year for you at that moment. Huh? This is a pretty scary moment that you will see. So we're in between fear and excitement. I'm not here to talk about the fear. I'm here to talk about the excitement. Huh? We are business men and women, and I think this is our challenge for the next few years. Today, you live in a digital, no, yesterday, we lived in a digital first world. All of you know it's mobile first, otherwise you wouldn't be Showpad customers. Huh? That's what you invested in. Tomorrow, a Showpad customer will be an AI first thinker. Uh, the personal assistant of the future in sales is going to be crucial. What is the biggest problem of this whole evolution? That we either get too scared about technology or too excited about technology. Because it should be about customers. Last week, I just heard this story about Larry Page, that um, every product that gets launched at Google, the final gatekeeper is still this man. And this is one of his famous quotes. We're inventing all these amazing things, but why the hell do we still have toasters that burn toast? I thought that was a brilliant question. It's because we get too excited about technology. We make toasters that send you an SMS message when the toast is ready. Even if it's burnt, you will get the SMS. So, so this is the paradox that we're in, guys. Uh, your world, the business world, is getting very, very complex, very difficult, very complicated. And your customers expect an easier than ever world. If I did my research for my, for my new book, I, I think I, I've been to three to 400 companies around the world to talk about these topics in the last three years. This is what I see coming back as possible benefits for your customers in this world of AI first. It's a world of faster than real-time customer service. It's a world of hyper-personalization, and it's a world of the most convenient interfaces you can possibly imagine. Now, the bad news, the kings of the world in this field are the super apps in the world. And as you can see, Superman is the team of the day here. Um, a few months ago, we were at Tencent in uh, China, in Shenzhen. And maybe you know Tencent is the biggest technology company in China. And they are the owner of WeChat. If you ask me, WeChat is the most powerful platform in the world, digital platform in the world. Sometimes in the West, we say this is the Facebook and WhatsApp of China. That is a big mistake. These guys are light years ahead of Facebook and WhatsApp. Um, they've got a billion users. They basically allow people to do everything they can. If you want to go on a restaurant, you book through WeChat. If every payment that you do is on WeChat, even private banking is on WeChat, booking taxis is on WeChat, the hospital bill payment is on WeChat, your driver's license is in it, your ID card is in it. Basically, they say WeChat is like the operating system of China. If WeChat is down, it doesn't work anymore in China. Now, some people think we exaggerate, but um, like, like I said a few months ago, we were in Shenzhen. I was there with my friend and business partner, Peter Hinzen. And before we started with our meetings, we, we, we craved for an ice cream. So we went to a store in a mall in Shenzhen to get an ice cream, an haagen store. And we were waiting in line. We ordered the ice cream. We got two beautiful cones with ice cream. And I decided to pay Peter an ice cream. So I grabbed my wallet, grabbed my credit card, and then it happened. The fear in that lady, her eyes, when she saw a credit card as a payment tool was indescribable. She looked at me like, uh-oh, I'm not going to get my money. She pulled out a big old credit card machine full of dust, 
that wasn't been used for a year, I think. And she said to me the magical words, I'm not sure if this will work. And she tried, and it didn't work. So we were standing there. The other Chinese people were looking at us like, yeah, people from the old world that came in. Huh? Then my buddy Peter, he's always very well prepared. He pulled out his wallet, and he had cash money, Chinese money. And then it happened. He put the money on the table, and the Chinese people behind us started to take pictures of us. Huh? <laughs> That was the first time in years that they saw their own money back. So uh, we thought, this is crazy. And if you think I'm exaggerating, these are people that are begging for money in the streets of China. I mean, the worst business to be in is begging for money in a world without money. That is a lost business model. So there's only one chance to survive, that's to create your own mobile payment system as a beggar. So I'm not exaggerating. We are people from the old world if we go over there. But if you look what Tencent and WeChat can do, it's this. I mean, it's the most convenient tool ever developed for a country. It is faster than real time, because think about the data that these guys have. I mean, the data that Google and Facebook have, it's like child play compared with what they have. They know everything. Everything. So they can tell the hospitals, in one hour, you will have 500 patients coming in with this disease. Be ready for them. They can tell the police, something's going on right there. You should go there and avoid the fight. And it's more personalized than ever before. These, I think this is a crucial challenge, to focus yourself <clears throat> on the customer and try to build that relationship for the day after tomorrow. And this should be your guiding star. This is my favorite Steve Jobs quote. Don't think too much about your shit of yesterday. Don't think too much about what you have today, but dare to dream about what could be possible and then work your way back. I mean, every company in this room has one challenge. That's to make sure that tomorrow you are still relevant for your customers. That's crucial. There are two ways to build your tomorrow. You can start with what you have today and make budget 2018. Huh? Open up Excel sheet budget 2017. Do save as change the 17 in the 18, add 20% to everything, and start the debate. Huh? That's a possibility. The other one is to dare to dream about the future and work your way back. Now, I have to be honest, I've done a trip to Silicon Valley with the board of the Efteling, huh? the famous theme park of Holland, I'm a, and was selected as the best theme park in the world, actually, by Theme Park Insider. Now, what they have done is amazing. Huh? They went to Silicon Valley, and what most companies do when they come back is they buy a ping pong table. These guys decided to describe the world of Efteling in 2030, taking into account all the things that they've heard about driverless cars. What does that mean for parking? The whole mobile and sensor thing. What does that mean for buying tickets and giving people access to the park? What can we do with AI and bots in the park? So they created that world 2030. Very concrete, very, very tangible. And now they're working their way back to change their investment plans for the next years. And maybe you've seen it in the news, but yesterday at the Python, the Python, one of their iconic roller coasters, there's no queue anymore. You don't have to wait in line anymore. They made it a virtual line. And this is the first ride in a theme park in Europe, actually in the world, where you don't have a waiting line anymore. That is a concrete consequence because they dreamt about 2030, and in 2030 they believe that people won't be standing in line anymore for 90 minutes for a two-minute roller coaster ride. So they said that is also the point where people complain about the most. Let's solve that. Whereas people have said in the past, you know, that's just part of the experience. Yeah, but now we're going to solve it. They dare to dream, and they work their way back. They're investing in that day after tomorrow. Now, in the second part of my talk, what I want to do is give you some ideas about investment access. How can you prepare yourself for this? And I see three investment access, and I see one battlefield. And these are the investment access. It's about effortless interfaces. It's about data as a leverage, and it's increasing the intelligence of your teams. I'm going to walk you through. Data leverage. This is one of my favorite young companies in San Francisco. It's called Planet Labs. They're five years old, founded by three ex-NASA employees and they built satellites the size of a shoebox. And every satellite has a high-definition camera on board, and what they do is they scan the entire planet every single day. Every single day. So it's like a scanner over our planet. And they take a picture of every square meter every single day. So think about the amount of data that these guys have. 
that you can imagine that the, the, the Secretary of Defense was their first customer. If Putin moves a tank to the left, they, they've got a picture of that. But their biggest market is the agricultural market. Um, because you know, like in the US, you have these huge crop fields. You actually need a plane to fly over it. And what they do is they use those pictures after there was nature damage. So in the past, there was an insurance guy coming over, checking the damage, and then there was like a subjective analysis on how big or how limited the damage was, right? An innovative guy brought a drone to look from high in the sky to the damage. Now, today, they use pictures from the day before and compare it with the day after the storm. Data is making the difference. Data can be a huge leverage to boost your business. If you go back to China, you have next to WeChat, you have Alipay, which, the, which is the other big mobile platform in payments. They were the first. They have 500 million subscribers on their platform. So they have all the data of all those people doing transactions. They used that data to create a credit score. And now they started with, a few years ago, they started with a new business line, which is offering credits and loans to those people without any big administration process because they use their credit score based on the data from their first products. So these guys use the data from product one to create product two. It became a spin-off of Alibaba called Ant Financial Services and is now one of the biggest starting financial companies in the world. They're using data as a leverage. If you read the results of the Obama campaign in 2012 and how they did their job, this is the quote that I think is the most important one. What they saw is that our gut feeling is worthless. And if you look at the data analytic tools that these guys just presented, I'm pretty sure in sales it's like that as well. Many times we think we know, but I think if you will look at the stats, you will see that in many times your gut feeling is pretty worthless. You need the data to set that leverage. And I think this is a flip in marketing and sales. In the past, it was a job where creativity was king. Today, creativity is still important, but data will be king. And you see in many pieces of research that there's a fundamental shift in the way that value is created for companies. Let me show you my favorite um, piece of research from the Harvard Business Review from the last few years. This is a study done by two professors that looked at what drives financial value of a company. And they looked at the acquisition value, so it's objectively measured value. And they compared that over a decade of time. Now, what did these guys see? That 10 years ago, the most important thing for a company to create value was the brand. Audi, HP, BMW, Hilton, Disney. Today, a brand is still important, but only half as important as 10 years ago. The rising star is the blue line, customer value. To what extent do you know your customers in person, and to what extent do you leverage on that? Now, this explains why Booking.com wins from the hotel industry, because the hotel industry still thinks that we love the Sheraton brand like we did 10 years ago. Sheraton is still a cool brand, but we prefer the interface of Booking.com. I recently went to Sheraton at Amsterdam uh, Airport. I booked through Booking.com, and I gave my loyalty card. And they said, sir, we cannot give you the loyalty points. I said, why not? You book through Booking.com. Ah, next time, book directly. Then we give you the points. I said, yeah, but it's 50 euros more expensive. I'll go for the 50 euros in that case. They still think I'm so much in love with them that I'm willing to pay more just to get some points. I want to have the convenience that I don't lose time booking. This is why Spotify wins from radio stations. This is why Netflix wins from TV stations. They invest everything in their interface, in their data, in their leverage. They invest nothing in traditional marketing. This is what you see in those companies on the wall. Huh? In God we trust, all others bring data. That's one. Two, new ways of interfaces. Um, and the word of 2016 and 17 was the word bot. Uh, this is my favorite example. This is Jill Watson. She is a teacher assistant bot. Uh, there was this very popular course in Georgia Tech University. And the teacher assistants couldn't handle all the questions anymore. So they developed Jill Watson. She took care of the basic questions. The humans took care of the more complex questions. Now, they programmed her in a way to make her really, really human. So she didn't reply in real time. They waited like five minutes or seven minutes because it was an experiment from that professor in AI to see if people would see the difference between a human or a bot. At the end of the year, many students 
asked Jill Watson out for a date. And they were completely astonished when they figured out that she was a bot. And you see communication changing. You see customer service changing. You see expectations changing. Uh, this is the symbol of 2017. I mean, if you're in a buying process, this is what you want from your salesperson, right? You, you don't want to wait for an answer. If you send out a message, you want to see the dancing dots. And make no mistake, these dots are the biggest expectation symbol in the world today. Huh? If these dots dance for 30 seconds and you get an OK back as an answer, that is the biggest disappointment of your day. Huh? Let's be very, very clear about this. But we're moving to this world of, of, of real-time service, real-time conversations, which is impossible if you let your humans do that alone. You need to support them with smart interfaces and smart software. Like, like this is one of my favorites. This is the side of the North Face, and I, I needed a rain jacket. And uh, then I talk to the machine, basically. And, and the machine asks me, OK, when are you going to use it? I said, well, I'm going to Yosemite this, uh, I didn't say the summer, I'm going to Yosemite. And the machine said, yeah, but when? Yeah, this summer. OK, this is the first selection of jackets. Anything else? I said, yes, it has to protect me against heavy rain. Heavy rain, no problem, these will keep you dry. Anything else? I said, yes. It has to be a blue jacket. I only wear blue jackets. And that, my friends, was a beautiful moment because the machine said, blue, that is my favorite color, too. <laughs> so you feel the warmth jumping off the screen at this moment. So I bought a beautiful blue jacket there at the North Face. And this is brilliant because you start to fall in love with these new interfaces really, really fast. And you're getting used to it very, very fast. This is my mantra, convenience is the new loyalty. You have to make it easy for your salespeople and for your customers. I mean, do you, do you also have like a, a, a bank contact card, a, a card to pay that you don't have to push the code anymore, that you just touch like the, the machine? Aren't you pissed off as well when you go to a shop where they have the old machine where you still have to type in that stupid four-digit code? It's like a waste of 10 seconds that you mentally cannot take anymore once to, you're used to the zero seconds. Convenience is the new loyalty. And, and I personally believe that. I mean, I mean, most of you guys are from non-digital DNA companies, right? So you have to make sure you're as good, which means you need to, if you cannot do it yourself, you need to get partners and tools to help you to create this. Like, this is what you don't want to happen during a sales meeting. Huh? Imagine that you decide not to work with Showpad, and you think, yeah, we can do this uh, by our own. This is not so hard what these guys are doing. Look, our doll is flying. But then this will happen. <laughs> huh? And now to be really sure that you understand why you need Showpad, we're going to watch this again. And we're going to look at the role of the father, because he's representing the customer service team of the non-Showpad customers <laughs> that always arrive too late because they are not informed. The interface is building your brand. And um, I mean, look at your mobile banking. Your relationship with the bank relies on the mobile banking app. If they don't do that right, it's terrible. And the cool thing is that many companies think that everything that I'm talking about is about the digital world, which is a big mistake. You guys know that it's a mix. I mean, sales happens face to face. You want to show stuff. You want to do stuff. This is not about something digital. This is about what, what is happening. And I think Alibaba is, is doing fantastic things in the retail space. They've got their Hema stores, not like Hema we have here in Belgium and Holland, but their own stores, which are like the stores of the future. All right, you, you walk in, you can get extra product information if you want, just by scanning it. Um, if you order it online, you can pick up your stuff, or you can just leave your stuff there, and they bring it to your house. And they have the same system like Amazon Go has. You just enter the store, you scan your Alibaba app on the gates at the entrance, which means you just grab what you need, you walk out, you don't scan, you don't need to pay for anything. It's just fully, fully, fully automated. And what all these companies do is they actually take out all the efforts of customers. And I think this is crucial in this day after tomorrow. How can you take out all the efforts for your customer? Because they just want to buy stuff, but they're sometimes making it so hard. I mean, tonight I'm flying to Madrid with KLM. I'm a platinum KLM member. I love KLM. It's a very late flight, and tomorrow morning I have to present very early. So I have an economy ticket. I have 300,000 miles. I just 
ask them a message, can I upgrade to business for this flight? I have done a zillion transactions on Messenger with them. Do you know what they asked me? They said, can you give us your email address, your PIN code, your platinum number, your status, uh, your flight number, your full name, your passport ID? I said, forget about the update, upgrade, guys. I, I mean, we've talked like 100 times. I've flown 30 times this year with you. You're still going to ask me all that information? That's an effort that I'm not willing to take anymore. If you want customers to buy from you, if you want customers to take advantage of all the great services, it should be zero effort. Otherwise, people just walk away in this world. Third item, intelligence augmented. Um, in customer service, in sales, this is going to be huge. This is not a time where your salespeople will be re replaced by robots. This is a time where your salespeople will get supported by robots and machines. Showpad is a fantastic example. In customer service, you have a company like Digital Genius, which is a fantastic example. I mean, these guys eat all the customer service data from a certain history. They translate it into algebra. They get questions from customers. They translate it into algebra. They match the two, and they help customer service teams actually to automate the process, because what happens next is that they look at the question, they look at the history, and they create their own answer. If that answer has a probability that it's correct, that is higher than 95%, they ship automatically. If it's lower, the customer service agents can still adapt the answer and personalize it and send it to the customer. They get support. They augment the intelligence. If you ask me, that's what Showpad is doing towards sales teams. They augment the intelligence of those troops. And the funny thing is, if you use software that is helping you to in augment the intelligence, what happens is your customer doesn't think that it's a technology trick. They think, wow, these sales and service people, they are top notch. They're better than the competitor. Probably competitor has also very good salespeople, but they don't have their intelligence augmented. This is like an invisible weapon that you have. So these are three investment axes. Effortless, data as a leverage, boosting the intelligence level of your people. But then I want to add one last thing, and this is a battlefield that we have to take serious no matter which industry we are in. We are entering in this phase three a new way of competition that we haven't seen before. And I want to take Amazon again as an example. Probably you followed this fantastic show. Uh, in June, June 16, to be more precise, Amazon bought Whole Foods, premium grocery player in the US. More than 400 stores. 13 billion. That day, everything changed because that was like the first day that one of those big tech platforms from the US bought themselves into the physical world. This is what happened at the stock market that day. These are the stock evolutions from the big competitors of Whole Foods. They all lost between 5 and 15% that day. At the same time, same day, Amazon stock went up with $32, which is a virtual increase of their value with more than $15 billion. So they spend about 13 billion. Their virtual value increased with 15 billion. That was a pretty good day for our good friend Jeff Bezos. That was June, right? End of August, first decision that Amazon makes when they own Whole Foods is this one. Let's lower the prices with 30 to 43%. In the food industry, where the competition and the margins are very tight. This is what happened at the stock market. I mean, this is Kroger like the coal route of uh, the US, bam, the day that Amazon bought them, bam, the day of the price decrease. Ahold, Albert Heijn, here a proud member of the Helamco Arena ecosystem, bam, bam. Minus 30% in value in the last three months, and they didn't do anything wrong. Maybe I have to remove the word wrong. Huh? They didn't do anything. Because those companies, to be really honest, were convinced that they didn't have to worry because they were in food and those Amazon players were scared of the food industry. Well, that changed on June 16. Look, this is a visualization of the competition in the retail world before June 16. You have all these players that are saying, oh, 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 I'm going to steal a little bit market share from you. Oh, but then I'm going to steal a little bit back. I'm going to do a promotion. Hi, I'm going to do a promotion too. I have a new brochure now. Wow, I'm going to do that too. I'm on Facebook. Oh, we're on Twitter. I mean, this video goes on for another 12 minutes, if you want. This is the history of competition in retail of the last 10 years. 
Then on June 16, this was the new style of competition. Huh? <laughs> this is Amazon entering the game. And you know what? This is now an example from the food industry. Something like this could happen in most industries. And this is a devil's dilemma in the day after tomorrow. What are you going to do? What is going to be your strategy? Are you going to build your own brand or are you going to partner up with the big platforms? Many people say, yeah, we don't want to partner up with the big platforms. We're making them bigger. Nonsense. You're shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, but then we don't have a brand anymore. That's true. So probably, if you ask me, this is what we're facing, a double strategy. Figure out a way with your company to take advantage of Amazon, Google, Alibaba, Amazon, Facebook, all those companies. And at the same time, figure out how to build your brand. Because this is going to become a challenge. The truth is, those big platforms, people buy stuff on those platforms. They communicate on those trans trans platforms. But worst of all, they trust those platforms. And you know why? The media can complain about them as much as they want. But these guys keep their promises. They don't let people down. Google works every single day. You don't need to shut them down for five hours because they need an upgrade. Amazon delivers every single day. And their goal is to put all your brands to a lower level. They're, they are like acting like a magnet of power, which means you have new hierarchies in this world. You have the platform players, and you have the others. Now the question is, how do you compete? I think the truth is, there's only one choice to accept that. Work with them, but build your brand. How to build your brand? Be good in that human touch. Make sure that sales conversation is really, really personal, really good, very personalized. That makes a difference. That's something that those guys cannot do. Find channels where you can com communicate to your customers that your customers still trust. And learn to deal with marketing to machines. You're not just doing marketing to people anymore. You're doing marketing to machines. And it's that combination that we need in this battlefield. That is that world of that day after tomorrow. And this is like the guiding star. It's not about technology. We don't have to worry about that. Others will figure that out. Our goal as business leaders, salespeople, marketing people, is to create these benefits for customers and to make sure that our company is still relevant in that day after tomorrow. And the only way to do that is dream big, work back. Guiding star, customer experience, dream, work back. Now, last thing I want to give you before I close it off is one last example about this, this guy. Um, I'm a huge fan of him. You will probably won't know him. His name is Mickey McManus. He works at Autodesk, um, which is yeah, a very famous company. I mean, they are known for AutoCAD. 95% of the buildings in the world are created on their software. So they have 95% market share. It's a huge company, but it's also a very boring company. I mean, when you have, once you have 95% of the market, the fun is, is gone, right? So they decided, okay, we can go for the 96%, or we are going to do crazy stuff. And they hired Mickey, and he's responsible for their R&D. And that's not research and development. That stands for risk and determinism. They want to risk a lot, but they also want to determine their own future. He's responsible to make sure that the day after tomorrow, 10 years from now, AutoCAD is a bigger company. And what he does is, is brilliant. So he has a secret lab in San Francisco on Pier 9. We've been to that several times. And his goal is to look for crazy customers. All of you have crazy customers. And crazy customers are those people that ask for stuff that you don't do yet. Those are the customers that stretch you. Those are the customers that you sometimes hate because you think, just buy the product, man. Don't ask us for all those extra things. Most of the time, we push demanding customers away. At Autodesk, they say, hey, what if we start to work with those demanding customers? And one of them was James Cameron, director of movies like Titanic and Avatar. About 10 years ago, James Cameron wanted to make Avatar, but he didn't find the technology to do it. He wanted to have actors with sensors, and that, that data was captured, and that then they could put computer animated graphics on top of that. So he went to Autodesk. He said, guys, with your software for making buildings, I think I can make Avatar. Most companies would say, we're very honored with the request, but this doesn't really fit in what we do. Good luck uh, with Avatar, Mr. Cameron, and we liked Titanic. Kind regards, CEO of Autodesk. They said, talk to Mickey. He has to help you. So that's exactly what they did. They changed the software. They started to build something that James Cameron could actually make this. They talked with his crazy customer. 
and they made it happen. That was about 10 years ago. Since that day, every Oscar, every Oscar that was won in the special effects category was created, the special effect was created on Autodesk software. It's now a huge new market for them. They had the guts to work with their crazy customers to create their own day after tomorrow. So this is a world of buyers. This is a world of customers. This is not a world of technology. This is a world where you can do crazy stuff together with your customers if you're open to do that. And I think this is the biggest opportunity for phase three. Most of us will freak out with the technology and all the doom stories about AI. I personally think if you're open to it, if you're willing to accept that this is a customer first world, a buyer's first world, you can do amazing things to boost the performance of your company and your people. Last thing I want to give you before I give it back to our host is a uh, last goodbye present in case you like the things that I talk about and you want to stay up to speed about all these changes and you don't know how, I'm very pleased to help you with that. Every Friday I post a video on my YouTube channel. It's called Stevens Week and it's a four to five minute update about what happens in this world of technology and customers. And this is from now on your show off tool on Monday morning. So I will tell you what will happen next weekend. You will watch that video. And then on Monday, you come in the office, you go to the coffee machine, and you tell your colleagues, did you hear about the battle between Netflix and Disney? And they will say, no, no, no. And then with full confidence, you will tell them that story. And then your colleagues... Thank you, thank you, and uh, good morning from my behalf, and thanks for having me. It's uh, so cool to be here at in one of the fastest growing Belgian companies in this space, and I really like the example with the, with the AR, because many people think AR is either for gaming or for the porn industry. And this is one of the most brilliant examples I've ever seen on how you can use it in, in B2B. And I personally think AR will be huge in B2B sales to create that experience. So I was really impressed with that. And thanks for, for having me here. I'm very happy I can share the, the story of customers the day after tomorrow, because I think if you look at where we are at this time in the digital world, it is a very, very interesting turning point. Uh, I, I have the feeling that we're entering a new phase. Uh, we, we moved from the digital world to the mobile world, uh, in the last 20 years, uh, and it all started when this man made his small announcement. This was the impact of that. Uh, so the, the, the big winners of phase two were companies like Apple, companies like Facebook. You still meet people that think that Facebook is not relevant for B2B companies. You still meet people that think that Facebook is going down because their neighbor's cousin's aunt is not using it anymore. These are the facts. Uh, 2017. 48% of the time that you're watching your iPhone screen is on a Facebook product. Thank you, thank you, and uh, good morning from my behalf, and thanks for having me. It's uh, so cool to be here at in one of the fastest growing Belgian companies in this space, and I really like the example with the, with the AR because many people think AR is either for gaming or for the porn industry. <laughs> and this is one of the most brilliant examples I've ever seen on how you can use it in, in B2B. And I personally think AR will be huge in B2B sales to create that experience. So I was really impressed with that. And thanks for, for having me here. I'm very happy I can share the, the story of customers the day after tomorrow, because I think if you look at where we are at this time in the digital world, it is an very, very interesting turning point. Uh, I, I have the feeling that we're entering a new phase. Uh, we, we moved from the digital world to the mobile world uh, in the last 20 years, uh, and it all started when this man made his small announcement. This was the impact of that. Uh, so the, the, the big winners of phase two were companies like Apple, companies like Facebook. You still meet people that think that Facebook is not relevant for B2B companies. You still meet people that think that Facebook is going down because their neighbor's cousin's aunt is not using it anymore. These are the facts. 2017, 48% of the time that you're watching your iPhone screen is on a Facebook property. 4% is on all other apps together. So, that's not bad, huh? if that is your company performance. But what we've learned in this phase two of digital is that those big platforms have become world dominant. Huh? We we've, have discovered world dominant players in the East and the West, huh? Google, Amazon, 
Facebook versus um, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and the power of these guys is huge. Huh? I, I mean, you probably followed the whole soap opera between Snapchat and Facebook. Uh, Snapchat is popular among youngsters, and at a certain day, Mark Zuckerberg decided that he wanted to buy Snapchat huh? because he wanted that target group to be part of his audience. So he took his private jet, flew to Venice Beach in LA, where the headquarters of Snapchat are, and he offered them $3 billion. Those guys 